So, let's start off with a quick prayer. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. So, I, I did give this a title, um, and I don't know what's happening to this, why it's doing this. So just bear with me a second. Oh dear. This is not good. Just bear with me. I'm sorry about this. So I did do, when I did this uh, did this message, um, I did call it pay your debts. Okay? And the reason I called it Pay Your Debts is I want to talk about, um, well I want to talk about the offerings. They're not the financial offerings. Um, as we all know we don't really do collections. We don't um, impress upon people the need for finances. But I'm talking about that bit of the Bible that says in the Old Testament these are the offerings that are due if you have sinned then there's a price to pay okay in Romans it tells us quite clearly the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord and that you have to pay a price so I'm going to describe very briefly what the offerings are in the Old Testament and then I'm going to compare them to what God expects of us now so the first offerings we come to in the Old Testament are the burnt offering Okay, it's a voluntary act of worship. It's not an essential part, so you don't have to do this if you don't want. It's voluntary, and it's an atonement for any unintentional sin, anything that we might have done. And it's more of an expression of devotion and commitment um, and dedication to God. The second offering is a grain offering. Once again, not an essential offering. A voluntary act of worship and all that's doing is recognizing that God's goodness and provision for us the next offering is a fellowship offering once again voluntary I'm going to describe a little bit more about these in a little while and that's a fellowship offering is a thanksgiving offering to God and a fellowship offering for the nation so you're saying I'm part of something more it's a fellow so you're saying we're fellowshipping with God and we're fellowshipping one with another a fellowship offering when it's given at the end is shared amongst the people so the food is distributed amongst the people a bit like a barbecue if you will if you imagine it that way and then we come to the two mandatory offerings mandatory means you've got to do this okay the sin offering which is atonement for um, once again for specific sins it's confession that we've, we recognize that we've sinned and we need forgiveness of sin it means that we're going to be cleansed from our sins so once we offer this we're going to be cleansed same with the guilt offering mandatory okay it says we know we've sinned we need to be forgiven we need to be cleansed we need in cases to make restitution now the difference between the sin offering and the guilt offering is this the sin offering says I've sinned and I didn't realize it but once I've realized it I'm going to make atonement a guilt offering says I have done this deliberately I have slandered my neighbor I have found something and I've kept it theft and it says you know you need to make restitution for these things so that's the difference between the sin and the guilt offering now when I first learned this I thought well surely the sin offering is we when we make a sin or commit a sin and we we recognize that and we go oh I need to be forgiven but no the sin offering is for those sins that we don't intentionally recognize but that later on we recognize that we've done something wrong so that's what they're offering for now those those offerings fall roughly into three categories so we have the burnt offering and the grain offering the fellowship offering but they're all voluntary you can choose to not to do that if you want to you can choose to worship God and you can choose to give thanks for the things that he's given you 
because that's what we're talking about with the grain offering. We would call, we would probably think of it as like we would do it at Harvest Festival when we go, here's some food. God has provided every every meal I've eaten. Here's some food. But it's voluntary. You don't have to do it. You don't have to recognise God. You don't have to show devotion to God if you don't want to. But those three show between them a devotion not only to God but to one another. The fellowship offering is a devotion to God and to the community that you're in, so to the Israelite people. The sin and the guilt offerings are mandatory. Okay? Whether you've committed them unintentionally or intentionally. We have a saying in this country, don't we? Ignorance is no defence. Okay? If you're doing 32 miles an hour or 31 miles an hour and the police stop you and say you were speeding and we're going to, we're going to fine you, you can't use any defence. If you were speeding, you were speeding. Now what we would do in this country is say, ah, but we're allowed 10% over and we're allowed... Well, officially you're not. The law is very says this is the rules. Now it might be that a policeman was willing to allow you to be 10% over, but the law says no. This is it. This is the line. And there is no defence. You can't say, I didn't know. You can't say, oh, well, you know, it was only. If you park illegally and you don't pay your ticket, and we have done this ourselves where we haven't just, we've just not seen the sign that says you need to pay for parking. And then we've come back and gone, oh, there's a sign there that says parking. And we have a ticket. We can't argue against that. We can't argue. We can't say, well, we didn't know. We didn't know. So that's why, so that's why the mandatory offerings are there, because they know God recognises that we're all going to sin. And he recognises that we need forgiveness for sin. Okay? It's not... It's not that if we do something wrong... I don't think I can explain this. If we do something wrong, there is a price to pay. In, in this country, we used to have a thing called debtor's jail. So if you owed money, they sent you to jail. And you weren't allowed, you, no matter what your pleading was, no matter how much you said, you know what, I promise I'll be good in the future, you were there until the debt was paid. Now it used to, go, I could never get my mind around this concept. You're in jail and you've got to, you're gonna stay there until you've paid how do you pay if you can't go and earn? Um, so it used to do my mind that, but it, it's the way it is. It's the way it was. If you if you owe a debt, you can't come out until you've paid it. Now we, we have the same thing every day. We accrue a debt to God. Every day we do things that God doesn't agree with. Every day we sin. I mean that's what it's called. We can call, we can sugarcoat it as much as we want. Well, God, it might not be what God wants, but you know, it might, it might not be the letter of the law, but God doesn't see it like that. He says, this is the way it's got to be. Or, it's sin. It's wrong. Now, when, you, when they used to come to with these offerings, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through this as quick as I can. When they used to come in these offerings, they always did it in a very specific order. So the first offering is always your sin and your guilt offering. You need to be forgiven. These are the things that are going to cover the sin that you've done. These are the things that are going to take your sin away from you. The next thing are your burnt offering and your grain offering. These are the, what they call the consecration offerings. Okay? These are the ones that make you sacred, that makes you holy. Okay? That consecrate you to the God. Remember, it's voluntary. I want to be devoted to God. So the first offering... The sin and the guilt offering, they're there just to cover up sin. They're the call the expiation um, sacrifices. They're the ones that will cover the sin. The second lot, the burnt offering, the grain offering, they're the ones that make you holy. And the third offering, the fellowship offering, is called a communion offering. And we'll be doing communion later. Because it's good. And it means this, the communion offering is there to say, look, as a community, we worship God. As a community, we, we, we share allegiance, we share th our thoughts and, and ideas towards God. 
we show goodwill to God, we show devotion to God. So you've got a, an offering to cover your sin, an offering to make you righteous, and an offering that says, I'm part of something bigger. We do exactly the same thing when we come to Christ. We come to Christ. Christ stands as an offering. But we do exactly the same things. The first thing we do, repent. You need to cover your sins. Repent. The second thing we do, we have a consecration offering. We repent, be baptised. And then the third thing, share your emotions and your thoughts. Repent, be baptised, be filled with the Holy Spirit. God knows what he's doing. Right from the very beginning he's saying, look, you need to be forgiven. You need to be cleansed and you need to be filled. You need to be part of the family. You can choose not to. And I know that there are many Christians that choose to just want to be forgiven the sins. I know there are many Christians that say, well, once, once, I, once I've been, you know, done through the sinner's prayer, once I've repented, that's, that's all I need to do. But no, no. Every day we need to be justified. Every day we need to come to God and say, look, I know I've done something wrong somewhere. Forgive me for that. Because I need you to make me holy in your sight. And every day we need to say, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because what dwells in me, I want what dwells in your people. I want to know you. We need to repent, be baptised, filled with the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians it says this, Now it's God who makes both, of us, both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We can choose to ignore to be wanting to be righteous in God's sight we can choose to not be part of God's family but we really need to be forgiven our sins oh well, this is a big word propitiatory sacrifice is no longer required to justify us and take away our sins Propiti propitiation means to act of appeasing God and we don't need to justify our sins because it mean, that means make righteous in the sight of God. Why? Because he says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He took our sins. Every day we build up a debt. It's like a little bank of every time we do a sin. And we have to pay for that. But we don't because he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Who's he? Jesus. Not only ours, but for the whole world. Not only for me, but for everybody. It says Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. The sacrificial system in, uh, that we're talking about is, 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 if you want to read about it, it's in Leviticus. And it was still actually going on when this letter, when, when, we talk, when we, they're talking about it, um, the sacrificial system was going for 70 years after Jesus. It actually finished in AD 70. And when 1 Peter was written, he's telling you, look, that system, 
doesn't need to be. These people were alive, they were seeing this system played out every single day, every single day. Forty odd sacrifices every single day. I read a thing and it said a vast part of the Israelite economy was based on sacrifice. Sin is a debt which has to pay, has to be paid and it does cost. In the Old Testament it cost the price of an animal. Hmm? And they weren't cheap. In Matthew it says two sparrows are sold for a penny. I still get people in the shop telling me, oh, fish and chips used to be 10p. You know what I mean? So I think to myself, what's two pennies in Jesus' time? It's extensive, it's a big cost. So when people are going to get the sins forgiven, they know that it's costing them. Every sin that we, incur, that we incur has a price. It creates that debt and we have to pay it. There's no shortcut, there's no evading that payment. Remember the, remember the, the, the debtor's jail? Until we pay that, we, we're going to be in debtor's jail. Now, for us, debtor's jail is simply this. There's no heaven. If you are sinful, you're not going to heaven. You need Jesus to, 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 to take that sin off you. You're not, you can't just heap up IOUs. It says in Leviticus, if a person sins and does what is forbidden in any of the law's commands, even though he does not know it, he is guilty and will be held responsible. Even if he doesn't know it. In any of the law's commands. I'm not asking you to go to Leviticus and read all the little nuances about what, the, what they consider to be sinful and not sinful, about the, the things that have to be paid for, but I am saying this, let's just take the Ten Commandments and go, let's run with them. And if you break one of them, whether you know it or not, you are guilty. And there's different payments for different people, God is a, he's a, he's, he's such a a gracious God, he understands, look, there's people with plenty of money, they can buy a bull. And there's people with, no money, with not much money, they can only buy a, 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 a lamb. And there's people with less money, they can only buy a dove. And there's people with less money still, and they can only buy flour. And yet when Jesus says it comes to pay the price, no matter how much money you've got in the bank, there is no greater Nothing is worth more than the Son of God. And he sacrificed his life for us. And then the question is, how do we serve him now? Do we recognise that we have a debt to pay? Well, here's how we do it. We are no longer in that sacrificial system where we take, we pay a penny and take a sparrow in Romans it says, Don't, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what the sacrifice is required. The old must die so that the new can rise. Hmm? Are we prepared to sacrifice out of ourselves? Are we prepared to offer those sacrifices that are voluntary? Those sacrifices that say, I want, to, I want to be cleansed. Lord, cleanse me. Forgive my sins, now cleanse me. Make me pure in your sight. Help me be part of your kingdom. Help me go and spread the word. Hmm? Hebrews says, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. How? The fruit of lips that confess his name. Simple. Go and tell people what he's done for you. Go and tell him how what you were is not what you are now. Tell him about the saving grace that he has for everybody. Everybody. 
if he saved me, he'll save you. It's as simple as that. And he did. So the old system says under the law, these are the boundaries. And Jesus said, I'll pay that price. Hmm? By one sacrifice he's made perfect those who are being made holy. He did that so that we can be free. Remember, if a person sins and does what's forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, any of the Lord's commands, even though he does not know it, he's guilty and he will be held responsible and he won't be released from that until he's paid the price. Can you pay the price? I can't afford to pay for the least of my sins. Not the very least of them. I could not pay a price big enough. So we need to be sure that we obey God's rules. His commands. Hmm? We need to remember what was freely offered. This is the covenant I make with them. That's what, he, that's what he says. That's what Paul says. This is the covenant I make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. But how many people want fellowship one with another? In the Old Testament, it was a fellowship offering that said, I am part of something. And yet I see so many people that say, I just sit at home now. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to fellowship. I don't need to be of one mind with these people. I don't need to discuss and know what their thoughts are because I have my own. You're not of one mind and one thought. Otherwise, you'd be fellowshipping. We need to voluntarily do these things we need to say I want to do these things why because it's the fulfillment repent be baptized receive the Holy Spirit the one spirit that joins us all together the one thing that we can physically do that shows that we join ourselves together is communion the fellowship offering in the Old Testament was shared out among the people Or, we can just face judgment. So if we don't do things voluntarily, then the things that we have to do, the mandatory things, will only get us so far. When you say, I've, I've got my sins forgiven, what then shall we say? Shall we carry on sinning? I know plenty of Christians that were, that, that that's their mantra. Well, I've, I've, I've been forgiven, so now I can just go and do the same. But I don't want that. I want to see everybody come to Christ. Why? Because he's the sacrifice. He's the thing that sets everybody free. In Christ, all three types of sacrifice are met if we accept Christ. We don't have to sacrifice animals. Why? But we do have to sacrifice of ourselves. Because if we don't sacrifice of ourselves and make the old die, here's what's going to happen. We won't be well. We won't, we won't be well. We don't need needless sacrifices. But we do need to sacrifice of ourselves. Why? Because if we don't, we will sacrifice something far greater. We will sacrifice relationships with those around us. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, actually... 
the problem we have nowadays is we, we could do with that old system. Do you know why? Because it's much easier. It's much easier to pay for something and have it destroyed and go, it's done. Hmm? It's much easier because then we can start thinking, well, we're forgiven because of our efforts. It's not given by grace, it's because we have put the effort in to go and buy a lamb and take it to be sacrificed. And it's done. We don't have to worry about it then. All we have to worry about is, where do I get one? Is it of the right quality? Are they going to do it right? See, I've always said that, I, that if we charged for salvation, if we charged to come into church, if we, if you said, look, if you want to be saved, then here's the cost. It's ten thousand pounds. No. Churches used to work on this principle. The Catholic Church used to work on that principle in in in, in years gone by. You can pay. To be for prayers, you can pay for salvation, you can pray that you'll miss purgatory. And I honestly believe that if we if we did that nowadays, if we said, look, this is the price that you're worth. I think we talked about the what how much we should be worth. If we could pay the price. If we could say it was a sliding scale and say, "Well, how old are you? You're 20, so you've got you've got you know 50 good years in you. So uh, this is what you have to pay." Then then we would have I reckon we'd have seats full. I see concerts with people that are paying 150 pound a seat, so that they can sing and come away feeling good for a few hours. And then just say, look what I've seen. And yet what we're offering here is healing for eternity. It's an eternal reward and people, it's offered freely. So they're not valuing that. You see, there's no value in free. Let me think of an example. You know the Happy Meals that you get at a certain branded burger place? And they come with a little toy in them. How much would you pay for that toy? I would pay nothing. Do you know why? Because it's free. It's free. It's part of something else and it's free. And if you said to me, here you go, there's a part, would you pay £2 for that toy? I'd go, no. How much did it cost you? And they go, well, it came free with the Happy Meal. And I go, well, I'm not paying for it. And sometimes I think that's how people review Christ. Well, it's free. So let's not bother paying for it. I don't want it if it's free. Another example. When I was a driving instructor, and I've used this one before, when I was a driving instructor, I used to charge £15 an hour. And this is many years ago. I think they're only just catching up now to where I am. So I, at the time, I was I think I was charging fifteen pound an hour. And uh, I went through. Um, you have to be tested every so often to make sure when you get graded. So I was graded, and I thought I'm going to put my prices up. And everybody else at the time was putting the prices up to I think it was about eighteen pound an hour. And I thought no, no, I'm worth more than that. And I put my price up to twenty five pound an hour. And this was. 15 years ago I put my price up to £25 an hour thinking well I might not have so many people but I don't need to do so many people to earn a living do you know people would phone up and say how much is it and when I was £15 an hour how much is it okay I'll get back to you I say no I say I'm £25 an hour uh, uh, when can you book me in when you can book me in you see value is in how much it costs So when we say you've got to buy a you've got to buy a bull and take it to be sacrificed, they go, it's going to cost me five hundred quid for a bull. Oh, there's a value in that sacrifice. 
But when Christ says, I'll give it you free, there's no value. Free has no value. See, the thing is, it's not free. We all know it's not free. We all know that when you come to Christ, your life changes. And not only does it change, but you lose everything. There's a story of the man that was saved. And he went home and he told all his family and friends and everybody. Thinking, I'm going to save them all. And a few weeks later he was sat in church and they went, how's it going? And he said, they hate me. I have no family, no friends. They've all turned their backs on me. They all say I'm crazy. You see, there is a cost where it's hidden. And that's why I think sometimes if we had to pay for sacrifices, we'd understand that it costs. There's always going to be a price to pay. It's a debt that burdens us. And yet Christ says, I will show you a way. In Romans it says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And I'm sure Judy's heard that many times because I know Ross likes that. You are making a sacrifice. Jesus says, I will, I will offer myself as a sacrifice so that you will both be forgiven your sins. You will be made righteous in God's sight. And I will seal your that with a promise, and the Holy Spirit will dwell in you, and you will be part of my family. But because part of those sacrifices are voluntary, we have to accept that. We have to accept that we're forgiven. We have to accept that Jesus is the sacrifice that says, "You are made righteous in God's sight." You have to accept. That he says, I will make you part of my family. And you can turn your back on them. All of those. But one day you're going to face judgment. And the question is going to be asked. Have you made the sacrifice to pay your debts? Now hopefully we're going to say, no, I couldn't afford it. But Jesus has paid for me. Jesus is my redeemer. He's given me something inside. Something akin to when you go with your coupon. And you say, I've got this. I want to redeem my packet of biscuits or my washing up liquid or whatever it is they're offering. And you say, I've got the Holy Spirit in me. We serve a God who gives much more than he receives. So when he says, come to me, let's do that. Or you can just be weighed under with the burdens of life and this world. You can be burdened with your sins and they'll make a different person of you. Or you can choose to voluntarily come to Christ. Because he's never going to force you. So what we're going to do now is um, we're going to take communion. We're going to take our fellowship offering in a sense. Because Jesus said do this and be members of me. Whenever you meet do this do this.